Father, we thank you so much for this day, and thank you for those getting baptized, and thank you for the excellent testimonies. We praise your name for it. And Father, we pray that you bless in Michael's life. I pray, Father, that he would do your will. And I pray, Father, also that uh, whatever your will is for his life, that you'd accomplish it. And I pray that his family back home uh, in Bangladesh would receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. I pray you bless Nathaniel as he goes back in January and he reaches them with the gospel. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Pray you bless the topic at hand and help us to comprehend it. And I pray your blessing upon the service. Help me be efficient and do your will. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take our Bible, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we pick up here in verse 9. God is faithful. That's, I'm sorry, let's stand for reading God's word. Uh, that, that was a great song, the uh, choir song this afternoon. Amen. Uh, faithfulness. God is faithful by whom we were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that uh, you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it had been declared unto me of, uh, of you, my brethren, by, which, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there be contention among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Paulus, I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Uh, or uh, were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any uh, should say I had baptized uh, in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Beside, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, but the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Thank you. you may be seated. So we see the declaring of division. And uh, Paul's writing to the church of Corinth, opens his letter uh, reminding the church of the calling of God, an apostle through the will of God. So Paul, uh, an apostle, uh, calls them to reflect on their call to salvation. And very important, beloved, that you go back and remember regularly when you were saved. And don't make up stories. Either you got saved or you're not saved, right? And don't, don't live in fantasy land. Make sure you know that 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 you're saved. And I like what George said in 1 John 5, 13. He said that verse I couldn't get away from. Uh, you know, uh, when God says these things are written, that you may know that you have eternal life. And George didn't know it, but he does now. Amen? Amen. <laughs> So, second of all, reflect on the call to be saints. And the Bible says that in verse 2, when he says, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, in them that are sanctified in Christ, called to be saints, uh, with all uh, in every place, called uh, unto the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So that's important that we're called to be saints. What does that mean, called to be saints? So in, in Catholicism, you're saying if you live a certain type of life, like uh, Mother Teresa was called a saint, and so on. But that's not sainthood. When you get saved by God's grace, you become a saint. Amen. That's what the Bible teaches. So I'm St. John, I just want to let you know. Uh, anyway. Uh, that's a wonderful thing, that we're saints of God. And the Bible says we're called to be saints. And that's a very important thing. So we must live accordingly. Amen. If you live uh, for Christ, you're going to live like a saint. <laughs> and uh, I say that with all sincerity. You know, Catholicism has it all wrong, but the Bible teaches we're called to be saints. And reflect on the role 
uh, in their called out assembly. Now in verse 4 through 9, Paul helps the church to give thanks for what the Lord had done. So thanksgiving for the grace of God. And I tell you, beloved one, for God's grace. We, we, we all instill our sin. And thanksgiving for God's gift. We are enriched by him. And thanksgiving for the return of Christ. We have hope. Jesus is going to come back. So I think he's going to be around an election. You don't know when he's coming back. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And thanksgiving for God's faithfulness. God is so faithful, and I thank the Lord for it. Amen. So Paul had said all this to prepare the hearts for the things he must confront uh, this church on. And the first issue that is dealt with is the division, the contention, and the lack of unity among the brethren. And this, this church was so fragmented. Remember, there was rich and poor in the church. There were people who were wealthy and people who had nothing. And we see that when Paul addresses the Lord's Supper. He, he said, and, uh, you know, people come with a feast, and there's some who have nothing. So I, I trust everyone's paying attention, guys. So we see in uh, Paul's unity is promoting in verse 10. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Now, you say, preacher, you think our church is like that? I think our church is close to being like that. And really, it's miraculous. It's supernatural that God is working our lives to be of the same mind, same judgment, Amen. that there'd be no division among us. It really is of the Lord. If you think about where most people, I mean, you look at our congregation. We have folks from Haiti. Uh, fro folks from Puerto Rico. We have uh, folks from uh, America. <laughs> you know, people from all over the world. We have uh, uh, China. There's people from all over the world, Bangladesh. And God wants us to be of the same mind, that there be no division among us. So Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, that we have unity of the Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 13, he said one, uh, one mind. In uh, Romans 15, verse 5, like-minded. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, one spirit with one mind. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, he speaks of one mind. So this is what the Bible says. And look at all these different men who wrote about this. One mind. So what causes division? Uh, I'll say it very simple. It's a three-letter word, sin. Amen. It's pride. It's selfishness. Yep. It's carnality. It's envying. It's strife. It's immaturity. Notice chapter 3, verse 3 of 1 Corinthians. And notice the Bible says, uh, Ye are yet carnal, for whereas is among you envying, strife, divisions. Are you not carnal walk as men? So we see, first of all, the beseeching by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said in verse 10, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For, I, for it had been declared unto me uh, of you, my brethren, that uh, them which are in the house of Chloe, that there be contentions among you. Now, the word beseech is to call to one side, to one's aid. And this has various meanings to call to one side for comfort, for exhortation, for uh, to be entreated. And Paul's beseeching in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ Paul was calling them 
to his side in the name of the Lord. He calls them brethren, verse 10. Verse 11, he says, my brethren. Paul used the title to show his love for them. Paul is stirring up their minds uh, in, by way of remembrance who they belong to. They weren't just Corinthians. They were a children of God. They belong to the church of God. And the question is, whose children are you? Who is your father? Whose family are you in? Notice Romans chapter 12, please. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Turn back a few pages. And the Bible says in verse 10, sorry, verse, chapter 12, verse 10. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. So Paul is speaking here about, you know, being kind, being, be, having brotherly love. In, in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 7, God says to add to our faith brotherly kindness. And kindness speaks of good, gracious, courteous, benevolence, uh, generosity, uh, mercy, goodwill, compassion, sympathy. That's, that's brotherly kindness. And it's so important that we demonstrate that for others. The opposite of kindness is harshness, cruelty, sternness, severity, roughness, maliciousness. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and uh, notice verse 1. And the Bible says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity or, or biblical love, I become as a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. So God says back in, in, in verse 4, Charity suffereth long as kind, charity envieth not. A charity uh, uh, vaunt is not itself, is not puffed up. So it's so important that we demonstrate charity with our lives. And notice Galatians chapter 5, please. Galatians chapter 5. And uh, notice uh, verse 19. So now the works of the flesh are manifest with these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, etc. So God says it's the opposite. And we don't want that. We want to put on kindness, brotherly love. It's a pause of approving. Uh, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit will lead us to love one another, uh, having brotherly kindness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse, verse 10, notice he says uh, about telling them to, be, uh, to speak the same thing. There's no division. There's uh, a perfect, perfect joined together and the same mind and the same judgment. And that's so important that we practice this. And I know we need to beef up on the same judgment, but I trust that as our church grows, when the new converts will have the same judgment. Now, uh, the Bible tells us, God says that there's no division. Uh, Paul urged them to uh, perfectly join together. Number two, the brethren of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 10, he says, division or difference of opinion. And when is it not to be that way? Now, I'm not talking about things that are personal. Some of you guys love foreign cars, semi like American made. You know, it doesn't matter. It's done, it doesn't change the world, right? And be thankful you have a car to drive. Amen? And lots of times people say, oh, I don't like, uh, you know, uh, uh, mixing food. I don't like Italian food. It's too spicy. And, you know, so on. It doesn't matter. Some people act like, where is he, Michael, Hindu food. Some people don't like it. It doesn't matter. 
doesn't matter. This is individual preferences. But when it comes down to judgment, it comes down to vision, comes down to what the Bible says, we should be on the same page. We should all speak the same thing. That's what Paul's trying to drive home here. And contention, he speaks of strife, quarreling, especially rivalry. And this is being contentions or, or causing contention. Rivalry often takes place in churches, but should not be named among God's people. And I say that with all sincerity. And many times ladies can cause contention over clothing. True. For example, maybe one lady gets a new dress or she has uh, a lot of dresses and uh, maybe another lady can't afford a new dress. So she doesn't acknowledge the new dress, maybe even harbors jealousy in her heart or maybe makes an unkind remark such as, oh, so-and-so always has a new dress. So what? Is, is that understood? Amen. So what? Amen. If God has blessed them and they, they can afford that, who cares? These are preferences. I'm just jealous. Well, you know, get over it. Maybe you weren't jealous God would bless you with a new dress. Amen. I'm serious. Amen. God has a way of dealing with us. You know, instead of wearing that potato sack, you maybe get a new one. Did I say that? No, I'm still recovering from the hospital, so <laughs> there are things I shouldn't say. <laughs> or why is she so frivolous spending all her money? How do you know she's spending all her money? How do you know? Maybe she's so loaded she's a gazillionaire. Well, she's flaunting it. How do you know she's flaunting it? See, these are things we don't know and we suspect. Maybe the contention comes from competition between the kids in the church. Oh, I've seen this. <laughs> Parents get so bent out of shape because their kids are fussing with each other. And you're going to get all upset. I can't believe that Johnny is, you know, and oh, my boy, my boy, uh, Billy, you know, I can't believe that he'd be treated in such a way. Oh, let me tell you, there's worse than that. You know, people can be so immature, frivolous, taking offense over children. It's nuts. And I'm thankful our church is not that way Amen. for the most part. Anyway, we have to be careful. The kids. Why are you taking up issues for your kids? Now, one kid's getting bullied, that's different. We're not talking about that. We're talking about them fuss with each other. My car is better than your car. My matchbox is better than your matchbox. So what? Who cares? It's a matchbox. It's not a real car. It's a matchbox. We understand that? Amen. You put them down on Hot Wheels. You don't drive them. What, what car do you have, uh, Carter? What's your best car? A Bugatti? Yeah. I don't even know what it is. Sounds like a watch. It's what? A Bugatti. It sounds like an Italian word. What's a, you got a Bugatti or something? You know? Do you drive it? No. You get inside it? Why? It's a toy car. Nathan, what's your favorite car? Lamborghini. Do you get in it? Did your father try to drive it? He couldn't fit. 
right? Nor could you. So these are, these are toys, things kids play with. Right? Would people get all bent out of shape? Well, you know, I wish I had a Bugatti. I wish I had a Lamborghini. Hey, you know, I wish I had a million dollars. It's not going to change the facts. I don't. These are things that are frivolous. And people get bent out of shape over them and cause division in the house of God. Or maybe it has to do with sports, James. That's what I think. So. I'm so sorry. That, uh, You know, people arguing over sports. I mean, come on. I sat there the other night <laughs> with some men, and uh, they said, Preacher, what do you think? I said, as much as lies, then you live peacefully with all men. <laughs> That's what I said. Amen. But I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 26, verse 21, as coals are to burning coals, and wood to fire sows a contention man to kindle strife. In Proverbs 20 and verse 3, it's an honor for a man to cease from strife, uh, and, uh, but, uh, but a fool will be meddling. So the church at Corinth had a variety of income levels in the church, and they, this caused contention among them. That's wrong. It's wrong. You don't want to see? I want to see people prosper. Amen. I do. I want to see the American dream happen to everyone. I don't want to see people backwards. I don't want to see people without work. I want to see you do the best you can. But a wrong relationship with Christ can cause contention. Hebrews 13, 5. Bible speaks about a lifestyle, a lifestyle without coveting and so it's so important to be content with Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 and verse 8, but godliness with contentment is great gain, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So if you have clothes and you have food, you'll be content. Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in respect of want, but I've learned in what sort of state I am, there would be content. I remember when we first started the ministry, I'm not asking you to feel sorry for me, this was a fact of life. I wasn't making enough. I mean, I had holes in my shoes. I'm talking about preaching shoes. You say, well, why don't you get, get new shoes? I, you can't get it with good looks. <laughs> I've tried it. So, um, but, you know, you have to live in, in, you know, and be content. And I was content. I used to go down to 7-Eleven and get cardboard from the matchboxes and put it right in my, my shoe, and that would last for about a week. I was out calling. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, let nothing be done through strife of vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other bend themselves. And that should be our goal. We should, we should be caring ab about the welfare of others. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul said again about speaking the same thing. No division. Now, the Bible says perfectly joined together, meaning no, no torn garments. In other words, it's, it has to do with garments and no difference of opinions. Then you say, well, preacher, I, I, I thought you said it's okay to be, but when it comes to doctrine, there's no place for a Calvinist to be in a church. Amen. There's no place for a charismatic to be in our church. We don't believe in the gifts. Right, amen. amen. And then he goes on and speaks about uh, perfectly to appear meant to render complete or perfect. Uh, 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 it speaks of being united. And why should we be perfectly joined together? Well, the Bible says we're the same Lord, same Bible, and same Spirit. There's no room for division. Now, the local church is the body of Christ. And as Christ is the head, there should be no division. Let's go back to John chapter 17, please. 
John 17. And notice verse 21. And the Bible says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that they would may know that thou uh, hast sent me and hast loved them as I have loved me, as thou hast loved me. So the, the uh, perfect unity is what we're looking for. And love for the Lord brings unity. Judges 20, verse 11, so all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. And that's where we should be in this church. And you think everything's going to be normal? We're headed for persecution one day. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a good thing. And there's going to be troublesome times. But we, we have to be prepared. And one way is by loving, caring for each other. Amen. That's, that's it. So the third thing we see is the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am a Paul, I am an apostle, I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius. And Paul is thinking here, did I baptize any, anyone else? Let me thought the household of Stephanus. So was, Paul was saved and called by God. Peter was saved and called by God. And Apollos was saved and called by God. And the Corinthians were choosing up sides. Well, my favorite preacher is Paul. My favorite is Peter. I love Peter. And then uh, the other one was Apollos. But who gave them the message? What Bible did they preach out of? They didn't have a variety of Bibles. So the idea is that Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. But yet following Christ is the utmost importance. First is following Christ and be what God wants us to be. That's the key. And the church wound up glorifying self and men rather than Christ. Baptism pictures unity with Christ and his church. So let's go to Galatians chapter 3. And uh, Bernie, would you read that for us? Galatians uh, 3, verse 26 and 27. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 27. For you are all children of God by faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. All right, so that's how we get saved. Faith in God. And in verse 27. For as many of you as has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Amen. So you've been baptized uh, in Christ, you put on Christ. That means you live the Christ-like life. And then chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same name were added unto the church. Now let's go back to Galatians, and we're going to close with this. Galatians chapter 4. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 4. And the Bible says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, uh, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So again, he's, he's asking for the church at Ephesus to keep unity in the bond of peace. Now then he goes on and says here in uh, verse 4, there's one body, and one type of body. It's a local church and one spirit. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one type of baptism, one type of faith. Uh, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. So he, he says there's seven ones here, and we should line up with this. as one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
and one God. And uh, the reason we, we do that is seven is the number of perfect, perfection. Amen? And so we have to live our lives pleasing to God in unity. There's no division among us. And you say, preacher, I, I have a, uh, you know, a, a squabble with someone going on in church. Well, I go up and make things right with them. If you're talking about, you know, uh, a Lamborghini or something else, stop it. I mean, it's a joke. Just don't be that way. And uh, if there's something doctrinal, show, show what the Bible says. But be on the same page with one another. And that's what Corinthians was teaching in chapter 1. All right. So if you're going to get baptized, please go prepare, and uh, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the, the study today, and I pray that our church would be on the same page doctrinally. Help us, Father, to, to know these things and help us to do your will. I pray, Father, for you, your blessing in our lives and... Uh, you know, bless you upon our church, and we'd all have the same mind. There's no division among us. Help us be, uh, as the Bible teaches, in unity. And I, I pray this for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and no one look around. I